And now we take you to Evangel Church in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. I had a birthday last week, and a lot of people sent nice cards and nice, uh, nice greetings, and, and a few people sent funny cards. And it's the funny cards that I like to share with you. This one was just given to me between services. It says, once upon a time, a very special person was born who was destined to change the world. Calm down. It's not you. It's Jesus. <laughs> Happy birthday. This one says, I wanted to get you really a manly, manly birthday card. But they didn't have any held together with duct tape, but happy birthday. <laughs> Here's one that uh, says, don't worry about another birthday. Age hasn't affected you at all. I said age hasn't affected you at all. That's funny. <laughs> We're in a series we started last week called The End Times, and I want to talk to you this morning about how to live in the last days, how to live in the last days. And take your Bibles, take your devices, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Also, I want to say welcome to our online congregation. So glad you guys have tuned in today and to be a part of this service. Several years ago, Kathy and I were privileged to walk through the Tower of London in England, and uh, in the Tower of London is where the crown jewels were kept. The crown jewels are the crowns and the tiaras and the diamonds and the precious stones that the kings of queens of England have worn throughout the ages, and they're absolutely exquisite. We walked through there, and I was reminded of a story about Queen Victoria. One day, a, a guest chaplain came to the Windsor Castle and he talked to the royal family about the second coming of Christ. And she said, oh, I wish that Jesus would come back in my lifetime. And somebody asked her, why, queen? And she said, because then I could take my crown and throw it at his feet. Well, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he says, Timothy, there is laid up for me and for everybody that loves Jesus appearing, a crown of righteousness. Think about that. For every true Christian, you're going to receive a crown of righteousness. And we will have the privilege of casting it at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. It says, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, the temple was more than just one building. It was a temple complex. There was a, it was more than just one campus. There were several campuses on the, on the temple mount. Okay, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. The disciples were impressed with them. They said, Jesus, isn't this wonderful? Look how beautiful all this is. And look at verse 2. Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now I want you to note the disciples asked Jesus three questions. And it's really important that you get these three questions. Because if you don't understand these three questions, you're not going to understand what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Because sometimes Jesus is answering one question and sometimes he's answering another question. And sometimes the third question. Let's look at these questions. Look at this. Tell us, when will these things be? In other words, when is this temple going to be destroyed, Jesus? That was the first question. Look at the second question. And what will be the sign of your coming? Tell us, Jesus, what's going to be going on before you come back? And then the third question is, what is going to be going on to let us know that we're living in the last day? So those three questions. And, of course, Jesus gives his answer in verse 2. Let's look at that again. When they said, look how beautiful the temple and the buildings are, Jesus said, do you not see all these things? As surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And of course, that was fulfilled just 37 years later. 37 years after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, 
the Romans came in and they utterly destroyed Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left upon another. So that was that prophecy was fulfilled really quickly. Verse four, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. We talked about last week how there's a proliferation of cults today. NBC News says that over 8 million Americans are involved in a cult because there's a proliferation of false messiahs. In fact, in, in, in the news yesterday, there was a couple in Idaho that are part of a doomsday cult and they have murdered the, the children of this woman. And they buried them in their yard, all in the name of serving God. Folks, I'm going to tell you, that is not what the scripture is about. You see, a cult is any group that leaves the basic doctrines of the Bible and the basic teachings of the Christian church. And it's so important, dear ones, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but God's word will never pass away. And I'm not saying that the assemblies of God have got the corner on the truth, but I'm going to tell you, we're a Bible-believing bunch. We believe the Scripture. We believe that it's inspired and it's infallible. It's the authoritative source of God's Word for us, of our faith and of our practice. And, and, you know, I've had people tell me, say, well, I just don't know if I go with everything the Bible teaches. And, you know, I, I just think we should have a... Have a Different view of things. Well, different, dear ones, when you get a different view from the Bible, you, you've, you've gone too far from me. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. Verse 6, he says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. We talked about how there's 10 wars going on today. There's 40 armed conflicts. Talked about it last week. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. You may want to underline that sentence. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In other words, there's going to be social unrest. There might be anarchy. So these are just simply signs of the times. And there will be famines. Famine is a result usually of war. There will be famines and there will be pestilences. Well, what are we experiencing right now? It's a COVID-19 is a pestilence. Man doesn't have the answer for it. Pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning. Everybody say beginning. Beginning. These are the beginning of sorrows. He says, this is is the, the, the beginning of the birth pangs. He says, the earth... Paul wrote like this in Romans chapter 8. He says, the whole earth groans and travail until now. The earth is giving birth. Something new is coming. You know, politicians call, talk about a new world order. Politicians talk about globalization. Well, I'm sure there is a move for one world government because it's going to set the stage for the end days. But dear ones, God's at work. These are just the beginning, he says. These are the beginning of sorrows. So the question is, what should our response be to these things? What should our response be? I remember as a kid, I was about 10 years of age, and we had a prophecy teacher who came to our church. And this prophecy teacher filled the the, the front of the church with charts and with graphs. And he taught for three nights and then Sunday morning and Sunday night. So we had him for five services. And my parents were interested. And so I was with him in every single service. And that man talked about the rapture. And that man talked about the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation. He talked about the mark of the beast and the battle of Armageddon. And I was shaking in my boots. I mean, I was afraid. I was scared. I would get home from school in the afternoon. And mom was at work. I got her on the phone. Mom, hey, I just wanted to let you know I'm home. And what I wanted to hear is I wanted her here to say, hello, son. Because I, then I knew that the rapture hadn't taken place. <laughs> and I hadn't been left behind. How many of you ever felt that way? Come on. I remember, I remember going shopping, going shopping and getting separated from my parents and thinking, oh no, Lord, you come back. You took them and you left me. 
Well, Paul said, let everything be done for edification, for building us up, for strengthening us. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. Dear ones, what should our response be? I want you to go back to verse 6 with me because we're told right here in the middle of the verse, I told you to underline it. He says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that your heart is not troubled for the end is, he says, all the, see that your heart is not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In other words, do not allow your heart to be overwhelmed with fear. Dear ones, if all you do is look at the news feed on your phone, if all you do is watch the news and read the newspaper, dear ones, you're, you're, you're renewing your mind all right, but with the wrong stuff. You're getting your focus on the wrong stuff. You're getting your focus on, 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 on things that are going to cause your heart to be troubled and that are going to overwhelm you. In fact, I was reading just this weekend. I didn't share this in the first story, but in the first service, let me share it with you. Psalm 61 I was reading what David said. He says, hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I'll cry to you. This is verse two. Here we go. From the end of the earth, I'll cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is in shock, when I'm in a place of disbelief, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. In the midst of a pandemic, what do we say? In the midst of COVID-19, what do we say? We say there's a rock that's higher than I am. And his name is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. What do we say in the middle of social unrest? What do we say in the middle of murders and injustice? What do we say in the face of inflation and recession? I say there's a rock and it's higher than I. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, God wants you and me to have peace that passes all understanding. In fact, the night that Jesus was arrested, just hours before he had looked at the disciples and he said, my peace, I give it unto you. My peace I give unto you. How many of you know somebody can try to give you something, but you got to accept it? I know we got some young people in the house. I've heard them. Somebody under 10, I want to give you something this morning. Somebody under 10. Oh, oh. there you go. What she have to do? She had to come and get it. She had to accept it. I could have held that dollar bill out all day long. Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. You can try to give somebody a present, but if they don't receive it, it doesn't do them any good. You got to receive it. So you and I have to, in the middle of darkness, in the middle of uncertain times, in the middle of of things seeming to be shaking everywhere, we've got to say, Lord, I receive your peace. I receive that peace that passes all understanding. I thank you, God, by faith that your peace is guarding my heart, guarding my mind. Lord, I give you praise. I give you glory. I thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. Verse 8, Jesus says, these are the beginning. I'm back in Matthew 24 now. He says, these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9 He says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Has that ever troubled anybody? Anybody ever read that and said, whoo, I'm going to underline that. Really stand on that verse. (laughs) Well, let me give you some insight. It was fulfilled in AD 70 when Rome destroyed Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, and the temple Josephus, the historian, tells us that on one day that the Romans killed over a million Jewish men, women, and children. Over a million people. This was fulfilled real quickly. But it's also still being fulfilled today. There's more persecution of Christians, especially in Islamic countries. There's more persecution of Christians than at any time since you and I have been alive. Verse 10. And then many will be offended. They'll betray one another, and they'll hate one another. 
many will be offended. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, he says, offenses will come. In fact, as long as you've got breath in your body, as long as you're functioning on this earth, the possibility of your flesh getting offended is very great. Because in this life, sometimes people do things differently than the way we'd like to see them done. People make decisions that we wouldn't make. Sometimes people do things that directly affect us. Sometimes people talk about us and it hurts. We can get offended. Sometimes people may tell lies and it hurts. Sometimes people may steal from us. Sometimes, you know, our wants and needs and priorities will come in conflict with somebody else's wants and needs and priority. And you know what that's called? It's called marriage. <laughs> Love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is there can be conflict and there can be offense. People can take offense at what's being said. I was talking to Danny Albritton earlier this week. He says, Pastor, I've never seen a time since I've been living that people get offended so easily. You can say something and you think it's innocent and somebody else thinks it's terribly incorrect and they grow offended. Well, here's the deal. Folks, offense comes from the Greek word scandalizo. Scandalizo, we get our word scandal from this, from this same word, okay? Scandalizo refers to the bait that's in a trap to catch an animal, okay? You use bait and you, you catch an animal in a cage or in a pit or somehow. The devil will use offense as bait to get you and I to a place that we are no good to ourselves and no good to others. And here's the way it works. I might get offended at something that somebody says or does or doesn't say or doesn't do. And that can lead to resentment in my heart. And dear ones, that resentment, if I fuel it with my thoughts, if I think about it, that resentment will soon become unforgiveness. And that unforgiveness will become bitterness. And that bitterness will become unfulfilled revenge. And that unfulfilled revenge will become hatred and animosity. And it'll start growing inside my heart. And it's like S.I. McMillan once said, the moment I begin to hate another man, I become his slave. I'll never escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. Dear ones, take it from somebody who's allowed one time, one time I was pastoring in a particular place and the former pastor would come and he started having small groups. He would invite members of the church to have small group meetings with him. And he, anyway, it, what, what he basically did is he was, he was taking church members away from the church. And oh, it hurt me. And I tried to talk to him about it and it didn't do any good. And I let that thing get down inside me and it became resentment and it became unforgiveness and it became bitterness. And you know what? I was my every thought. I could be driving down the road, be thinking about something else. And suddenly I find myself focusing on what that guy had done. And I would get so angry. Remember, we get ulcers not from what we eat. We get ulcers from what eats us. And this thing was eating away at me. And dear ones, when you give place to an offense that becomes resentment, that becomes unforgiveness, that becomes bitterness, that becomes unfulfilled revenge, which becomes hatred, which becomes animosity, that thing will get down on the inside of you. One of two things is going to happen. Either, number one, you're going to do something really mean and cruel to somebody. I mean, you are going to let them have it. And if you go through life with enough of that stuff, if, if something bad happens here and something bad happens over there and somebody hurts you over here and you get hurt over there and you get over there, before, before long, you're going to be like a, a volcano just ready, just ready to erupt at any time. And usually you'll erupt at the person who least deserves it. You'll either do something really horrible, you'll get angry and let them have it. 
or you'll let that thing smolder on the inside of you. And all those negative emotions will be down inside and you'll find yourself giving, getting upset at just anything and everything. You'll have a sense that the world owes you something because you got hurt and somebody treated you wrong. Now fast forward it, you hold on to that stuff for months and years and decades and decades. How many of you have ever known an angry old man? How many have you ever known a, an old lady that you didn't want to be around? I just want to suggest to you, if you hold on to that stuff, and you hold on to that stuff, it's going to make you an angry person in old age. Today, every single one of us know people that are in bondage to alcohol and drugs. They've got addictions in their life. And if you ask them, what, what, what caused this? They'll say, well, I, I got hurt and things wasn't, weren't going well and it just was easier to, to take a drink. It was easier to, to shoot up. It was easier to take a pill and, and it seemed to help me. Well, dear ones, it's not enough just to take that person through a program and get them set free from the narcotics or from the alcohol or from the drugs. You've also got to help get healed on the inside. You see, they got to deal with, that, with that, that, that thing that started as an offense and ended up as hatred in their heart. And see, you can only go through life giving off negative emotions for so long. At some point in time, those negative emotions are going to turn inward. It's kind of like taking a, a tennis ball and, and throwing it up against a brick wall. You can only throw it up against that brick wall for so long, it's going to keep coming back to you and back to you and back to you. And when you give off hatred and you give off resentment and you give off seething anger at other people, at some point in time, it's going to come back to you and it's going to come back in the form of despair and depression and feeling down. There are people today that are depressed and they don't know why they're depressed. There are people today that have everything under the sun and yet they're in despair and they don't know why. I just suggest to you it started because they let an offense into their life and that offense became resentment and that resentment became unforgiveness and that unforgiveness became unfulfilled revenge, and that unfulfilled revenge became resentment, uh, b became hatred and animosity, and they held on to that thing. Dear ones, we don't forgive other people because they deserve to be forgiven. I forgive other people because I desperately need to be set free from those negative emotions. I desperately need to be set free from that sense of offense. You see, I don't want the devil to use that as a scandalizo. I don't want him to use it to entrap me and to keep me from being useful. Jesus said that when you stand praying, forgive that your Father in heaven may forgive you. Amen. Also, there was life is short. It's not worth holding on to it. Now, I felt like I'm preaching a little better than you're listening this morning, but it's a thunderous silence in this place. Verse 10, and then many will be offended and will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness, lawlessness is iniquity on steroids. Lawlessness is rebellious iniquity lawlessness is God's word saying this is the way if you want to be blessed this is the way to live but we say no you know what I'd rather live the way I want to live I want to do things my way because lawlessness will abound the love of many will wax cold Amen. you know King David had a friend that was very dear to him. He writes about him in the book of Psalms. He says, oh, how we used to walk into the assembly of your house together. His friend's name was Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's trusted counselor and confidant. But Ahithophel also had a granddaughter who was a very, very beautiful girl. Her name was Bathsheba. You remember what David did with Bathsheba? David took Bathsheba and 
it looks like he forced her into a sexual relationship and she gets pregnant in that relationship. Then David forces her husband to go to war in a way that he gets killed in war. So David murders her husband. Nathan the prophet comes to, Nate, t- comes to David and he confronts him with his sin. And David repents. We've got Psalms chapter 51. Dear ones, just because you repent of your sins doesn't mean there's until not. We reap what we sow. There's still repercussions. David sowed the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Just look at what happened to his own family. Man, he had a, one son that rises up and rapes a half, half-sister and got another son that leads a revolt against him. Well, guess who was counseling Absalom to revolt against his daddy? Ahithophel, the counselor Ahithophel. In fact, when David learned that Ahithophel was with Absalom in the insurrection, he thought, oh my, we're really going to have a hard time because he knew that man was very smart. But God worked it out so that Ahithophel did not follow David's instructions. Or excuse me, Absalom's instructions. And when that happened, remember the story? Ahithophel, the Bible says he saddled his donkey. He rode to his hometown. He put his affairs in order. And he hung himself. He committed suicide. Dear ones, I want to suggest to you that that suicide started when Ahithophel got hurt because David had destroyed his granddaughter's family. That offense started. I, I, and folks, that, that'd be, if, if somebody did that to one of my granddaughters, I'd be angrier than a mama bear rubbed over cobs. But at some point in time, dear ones, all of us have to say, God, vengeance belongs to you, not to me. I'm going to let you pay David back. And, and David did. His whole life changed. His kingdom was never the same after what he did. But Ahithophel is a guy who wouldn't forgive And wouldn't let God fight his battles. I'm just saying to you, let God fight your battles. But he who endures to the end will be saved. That word endure means to hold your ground in conflict. Means to bear up against adversity, to hold out under stress and stand firm. Persevere under pressure. He who endures to the end will be saved. The person who blocks out offenses. The person who doesn't allow iniquity to find a place in their heart. He who endures to the end will be saved, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Dear ones, why do we place a high value on missions? Why do we place a high value on evangelism? Why do we place a high value on sharing this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's only one reason. Jesus said, when you share the gospel, at some point in time, I'm going to come back. As you share the gospel, you say, well, why hasn't Jesus come back already? Let's look at some verses. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 Read this aloud with me. But of that day and hour, come on, do it aloud with me. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Chapter 25, verse 13. Read this aloud and loudly. Here we go. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You don't know the day or the hour. A lot of you will remember that, at least those of you that have been around a while, you remember that a book was written in 1985, entitled 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 1988 by a man named Edgar Wisenant. 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back, he said in September of 1988. Well, 300,000 copies of the book were sold. When Jesus didn't come back in September of 1988, he says, oh, well, I miscalculated. So he wrote a second book, said Jesus is coming back in 1989. When that didn't happen, 
He had already sold 30,000 copies of the second book. I guess he had made his money. He passed away in the year 2000. But people, there have always been prophets saying Jesus is coming back on this particular date. But the Bible says nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven. Nobody knows. But I tell you, he's coming back. Well, what is it that would keep Jesus from coming back? Every prophecy that I know of in the scripture has been fulfilled. We've seen Israel become a nation again in 1948. And the times of the Gentiles, you read about that in about the 18th and 19th chapters of Luke. The times and the seasons of the Gentiles has passed in Israel. Israel became a nation in 1948. There was a war in 1966 or 67, the Six Day War. Israel took all of Jerusalem. The only thing I know that would keep Jesus from coming back is that heaven is not yet populated enough. The Lord is waiting for you and me to get serious about this thing called the Great Commission. He's waiting for you and me to get serious. See, as Pastor Zach shared with you, you've got an opportunity. Next Saturday, in Jesus' name, you'll be able to give out. We've got 1,344 pre-made boxes of cold food coming the USDA, USDA bought this from the farmers so they wouldn't go under. And then they gave it to Convoy of Hope. Each box contains four pounds of vegetables, four pounds of fruit, five pounds of pre-cooked chicken and pork, one pound of butter, one pound of cheese, one gallon of milk. And we, and we, we didn't know what, they said, we're going to bring it to you. Well, we don't have refrigeration space for that. So Zach called Combo, it called um, the second harvest of the Big Ben. And we talked them into receiving it. They're going to put it, they're going to refrigerate it for us. They're going to bring it to Godby High School. But you and I get to give it out in Jesus' name. There was he who gives a prophet a cup of cold water will receive a prophet's reward. See, we get to give this out in the name of Jesus because Tallahassee needs hope. And Jesus is the hope of glory. This gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached over the whole earth, and then the end shall come. Jesus' very first sermon, Luke chapter 4, he's preaching out of Isaiah 61. He says these words, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Dear ones, that acceptable year of the Lord, if you'll study it, it's the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years in Israel, they proclaimed a Jubilee year. What the year of Jubilee meant, it meant that ancestral property was returned. It meant that debts were canceled. Everybody listen to me. God does not like inflation. Inflation hurts people. Inflation creates an uneven playing field. Inflation causes some to really do well and others do really poorly. God didn't like that. So he said every 50 years in Israel, there's going to be a year of Jubilee. So if I own some property that my father left to me, I can sell it to you, but I can really only lease it to you for up to the 50 year Jubilee time. And then it's got to come back into, into, into my, that deed has to come back into my household. Any debts that have occurred. If you're going to loan a person money, you know that the year of Jubilee is coming. And so you're going to only loan them what, what they can pay back before the year of Jubilee has come. That's the way the whole thing was made is because God doesn't like inflation. And the year of Jubilee is a year of victory, of freedom, of favor, and of God's spirit. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Kathy and I have been on a, a type of a Daniel fast since M May the 12th. My dad passed away on April the 20th. And 22 days later, we started this makeshift Daniel fast. And just giving ourselves extra time to seek God's face. And I proclaim to you, God wants this to be a year of jubilee. 
He wants this to be a year of God's favor for you. Everybody listen to me. The devil wants this to be remembered as the year of COVID-19. The devil wants this to be the year of, of social unrest and of murder and anarchy and of recession out of inflation but I prophesy to you this is to be a year of jubilee and a year of freedom and a year of the Lord's favor in your life there are people who desperately who desperately need the message that this is the year of God's favor this is the year that God wants to bless you there are people all over Tallahassee dear ones every one of us is made in the image in the likeness of God Almighty but as we see him as we seek Jesus as we seek more of the Holy Ghost he pours out his spirit upon us and he starts bringing favor see favor changes the way people look at you favor will cause God will cause people to bless you who wouldn't previously bless you favor will cause people to give you a good deal and they don't even know why they're doing it it's the favor of God on your life and favor can cause the Holy Ghost to fall Folks, there are neighborhoods right here that need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There are people that are in despair today and they need a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. It's the year of God's favor. I said it's the year of God's favor. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro over the face of the whole earth looking for those whose hearts are upright before him. Dear ones, I'm just telling you, this is not a day to get down and out and, get, and, and just let your, your mind and your emotions be focused on the COVID-19 and be focused on social unrest and be focused on recession and inflation and how expensive groceries are and how, oh Lord, how am I going to do this and I'm going to do that. He says, I want you to look up. Your redemption draws not. I want you to look towards heaven because Jesus is coming back but he wants us to help populate heaven see there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and apparently our Lord just believes there aren't enough people yet to populate that for all eternity so he's telling you and me to get on with it you can do it this Saturday by helping to give out food all you have to do is you can't sign up here but you can go online and sign up get on your phone and sign up but here's what you need to do you need to start proclaiming this is the year of jubilee for me this is a year of god's favor for me see i can't create god's favor for you you can't create it for me <laughs> But my wife and I go into the place of prayer and we say, Lord, we thank you for your favor. We thank you for divine favor. We thank you for divine favor. We thank you that you're at work to willing to do of your good pleasure. I thank you that you're going to make a way where there doesn't appear to be a way. I thank you, Lord God, that we're not going to think small. We're going to think big. We're not going to just try to get by. This year of 2020 is not going to be just a year of just getting by because of the COVID-19. This is not just a year where we're going to just, we're, we're going to say, I wonder what's going to happen in the world. No, no, no. We know what's going to happen. This is the year of God's favor. I'm prophesying to you. If you'll receive it, this is the year of God's favor. This is the year that God's going to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. But you've got to receive it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand to our feet. Come on. Let's stand to our feet. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I can't have an altar call this morning because we'd get more than six feet together. But I, here's what I want you to do. Just right where you're standing, all over this room, I want you to declare the favor of God in your life. I want you to declare the favor of God over this house. I want you to, dec to declare the favor of God over this congregation. I want you to declare the favor of God over Tallahassee. I want you to declare the favor of God over the United States. I want you to proclaim the favor of God. I want you to seek him with all your heart and say, God, pour out your spirit. God, there are people who are down and out and they desperately need you. God, pour out your spirit. Use me, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, I pray for your favor. God, give us your favor. We believe you for favor. Oh, the old devil may come in one way, but he has to flee seven ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
And favor doesn't mean things will be magical. It doesn't mean that, that, that things won't, will, will, will just happen all the time, but it does mean that God's at work. God's at work. God's at work. See, some of you have been praying and praying and praying and saying, God, I, I want this prayer answered and that prayer answered. I'm going to tell you the favor of God brings answers to prayers. God, we thank you for your favor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. He has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed us to bind up the brokenhearted and to set at liberty the captives. He has anointed us. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We magnify you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, you've anointed us. Come on, say it. I'm anointed of God. Come on, say it. Proclaim it. I'm anointed of God. He's anointed me to share the gospel with the poor. Come on. That's the, the poor people, those that have a poor in spirit that will receive it. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Come on, say it. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. I speak and I prophesy liberty to everybody that's in captive to sin and self. To their own flesh. To the devil. In Jesus' name. And recovery of sight to the blind. Lord, we speak healing. We speak recovery of sight. We speak liberty to those who are oppressed. You foul, afflicting, tormenting devils that would talk, try to oppress people. If you're in this room this morning and you've been oppressed by the powers of hell, I break that oppression right now. In G if you're watching over the internet and you've been oppressed by the power of hell, I break it in Jesus' name. If you're watching on Fox broadcast channels right now, I break the spirit of oppression. I break it off your life from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' mighty name. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of God's favor. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.